I love that session five is about creating traditions and fun to enshrine all the stuff that we've been talking about with the Synod at home. <laughs> How cool is that? You know, God didn't create us to be boring. He created us to, to create. We're made in his image and likeness. And he wants us to share his creative joy. And in fact, he created us to party in a very real sense. Think about this before you accuse me of being a heretic. Heaven is described as a wedding feast, a wedding banquet. That's our ultimate termination, our ultimate destination. That's where we're going. That was God's dream for you when he created you, that you'd end up at a wedding banquet, the place of, of pure joy that flows from love and celebrates that love forever. Why not start now? Hmm? You know, uh, th there's something, I, I've, I've been all around the world preaching the gospel uh, with our ministry, Real Life Catholic. And I've seen Catholic cultures in so many different places. You know, and there's something I call the Louisiana or the New Orleans anomaly. There are places that are post-Christian where people are very resentful of the faith. And I think it's because in those places, the faith was never really tied in their minds, in their culture, and their psyches to a celebration of life. In New Orleans, oh, it's very post-Christian. Mardi Gras does not look like a Catholic celebration uh, in, in a lot of the sectors of the city there. You know, but... I'll tell you what, there's a weird openness to Catholicism, even among the atheists there. One of my friends sent me a news article written by an atheist about what he was giving up for Lent. Why is that? Because every celebration in that city is tied to a Catholic feast day, that's why. <laughs> it's in their DNA. I think there's a unique openness that people have who have forgotten God to being re-evangelized there because they don't see it as something coming into their lives to take something away. But the very thing that taught them how to celebrate life. You need to do the life, life that way. You need to do family life that way, friendships that way. Your faith has got to be central to the part of life that you celebrate and to how you celebrate life and why you celebrate life and the, the beautiful ebb and flow of fasting and feasting. This is central in, in Catholic life. How awesome is that? You know, if there's a reason my own kids are in love with Jesus and praise God, they all knock on wood, they all love Jesus right now, uh, uh, I tell you, man, it's because we celebrate life together a lot. And they see their love of Jesus as tied to their love of a good burger, a sunset, singing karaoke and having fun, and Jesus. And it's all part of this big, beautiful ball that we call life. And life is a gift from him who is the author of life. So we land this, this, uh, this whole, this whole uh, you know, fifth session focusing on tying all this in to forming traditions and celebrations and fun. Thank you, Chris, for that rousing reminder that God doesn't want us to be boring, but creative. And creative, you certainly are. Thank you for having started each of our gatherings with your wise and enthusiastic words. You and your team at Real Life Catholic have been a blessing to our church and to the Archdiocese through this Synod at Home. Before we hear more about the traditions and fun, let us begin our time together with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, when you walked on the earth, St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother guided your holy family in following the religious and cultural traditions of the Jewish people. You showed us that those traditions often included food and fun while helping your chosen people to remember your fidelity to them. While on earth, you sought to purify traditions that had been corrupted over time. When you established your church, you created new traditions that often built upon the old ones. Come and be with us in this gathering as we reflect upon the traditions in our lives. Help us to recommit to the traditions that you instruct us to follow and stir our hearts to renew any traditions and fun in our lives that have been corrupted by sin or grown stale. Inspire us to institute new traditions that will bring us joy and draw us closer to you and to one another and remind us throughout that fun and recreation that these are to be important parts of our lives and that they are a foretaste of the wedding feast of heaven. 
We ask all this in your holy name, Jesus. St. Paul, patron of our archdiocese, pray for us. St. Joseph, patron of our synod, pray for us. And Our Lady, cause of our joy, pray for us. Before I turn it over one last time to Yen Fasono, our host of the Synod at Home, I want to thank you for your participation in this series. Please know of my prayers that the work of God, which he's doing in your home during this Synod at Home, may bear great fruit during the rest of your time on earth, and possibly for generations to come as well. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you, Bishop Cousins, for praying with us today and throughout the Synod at Home gatherings. And thank you all for joining us one last time as we talk about the importance of traditions and fun in our faith. Like many of you, I've been very excited for this topic. During the last gathering, we talked about how generosity and service is an important way we follow the example of our God who loves us, and that doing so brings us joy. Hopefully you found inspiration from Pat and Kenna, the generous testimonies, or the incredible story Dan Moran shared in the bonus video. For this gathering, we will learn how traditions help us focus on what is important in life and prepare us for the joy that awaits us in heaven. Chris reminded us that celebrating life together is an important part of our Catholic faith. To learn about how we can more fully integrate traditions and fun into our lives, I welcome back two people who really know how to celebrate. Pat and Kenna Malay. Thanks so much, Yen, and welcome back, everybody, for our final Synod at Home gathering. Woo! Can you believe we're here? Traditions and fun! Pat's been waiting for this for a really long time. I'm good at a few things, but traditions and fun are one of those things. Um, and this came up early in our marriage, actually, um, soon after we got married. So here's the deal. We love Easter, like, a lot, which it's good to love Easter. It's like the most important feast in the history of the world. Um, so we were trying to think of ways early on in marriage of like, how are we going to celebrate Easter, not just liturgically, right, with, with the prayer and, and with the triduum and all that, but how are we as a family going to really make this highlighted the way it ought to be? And one of the th things that we talked about is that Easter Sunday is such a huge feast that it's actually an eight-day feast, right? Easter Sunday lasts for eight days. It's what we call an octave. So now in our family, we celebrate an ice cream octave every year beginning on Easter. So literally it's, every it's day. It's as absurd as it sounds, guys. It's <laughs> <laughs> every day, starting on Easter Sunday for eight days, we go get ice cream at a different place around the Twin Cities, which has made Easter very exciting for our children and for me. And it just really like starts to cement the importance of Easter in a really fun way. It also cements my waistline in a not fun <laughs> way. Totally worth it though, doesn't matter. <laughs> so today, uh, not only are we talking about ice cream, um, but really talking about creating culture um, in our family around our faith. And, um, and when we talk about culture, it's, it's the stuff around us, right? The customs, the messages, the traditions and the beliefs, the values that we hold, um, and they're in our world. Um, we bring it into our home. It's the air that we breathe and the water we swim in, and it's forming us whether or not we realize it. Um, it happens to us whether or not we submit to it. And so um, as Catholics, we want to say, like, let's be intentional about forming that culture um, for our family and creating traditions that really speak to um, the meaning of our faith, and um, give our life its flavor, give our life its rhythm, and gathering together for things that are important and really valuable for us. And they're just such a great way to take those beliefs that you were talking about and bring them to like practical real life application, right? Like when we were uh, preparing for marriage um, years ago, we were talking through our, our beliefs and our priorities. And one of the things that we came to is that ice cream aside, we really do love Easter, right? And the Triduum uh, from Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, all the way up to Easter Sunday, like those are the most important days of the year for us, you know? So we really wanted to commemorate that in our family, not just with ice cream afterward, but how are we going to really celebrate this Triduum and Easter and give it the, the glory that it really deserves? And one of the things we decided from the beginning is that we are going to celebrate Easter and the Triduum just with our family, with our immediate family, that we're not going to travel, we're not going to host, um, and we're going to celebrate at our home parish. We're going we're gonna to really intentionally invest in this time of prayer as a family with our faith community. You know? So one of the things that we do in our family as well is we, we intentionally inject more silence into our family from Holy Thursday night 
until the Easter Vigil on Saturday night. Um, now, we have seven small kids, so it doesn't mean all silence. It just means more silence. But really, like, there's no screen time. We don't even really get into, like, playing games and stuff. Like, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of prayer. It's a lot of intentional rest. And it's just a beautiful way to kind of grasp the feeling of that triduum. You know, it, it was a great way now for, uh, for us and now for our children, obviously, to really feel what the triduum's about. And I think this idea of traditions are... Um, taking our beliefs and and making them manifest, right? Especially for our kids, for the little ones to understand what it is we believe. Um, so just as you know, Easter is set aside for our immediate family at our home parish here in the Twin Cities. Um, we make the tradition of visiting family, extended family, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, because those relationships are a priority for us too, um, and they have great value, great significance to us as well. Um, and the traditions that we have. Um, are, are there to engage the whole person um, of each of the family members. So there's something for all of us, for our heart and soul, um, our body, our imagination, our emotions, um, to really enter more fully into what it is we believe and who it is we're trying to become. That's one of the reasons that I just love traditions and fun. Like I, you guys, I am too obsessed with Christmas. <laughs> like it is so hard to wait until Advent to even think about Christmas and we try to do Advent well, but then I just kind of let Christmas bleed in, right? Because <laughs> what, what it does, I mean, Christmas, Easter, birthdays, um, whole days of obligation, like they take the, the truth of spiritual and rational things, the things of God that are a little bit more abstract, right? They're not tangible. They're not concrete material things. Our traditions make those things concrete. They make them material. They make them tangible for everyone in the family. And I see that really clearly, you know, with our kids, you know, for example, in our dining room, we have the wedding pictures of, um, great, well, their great grandparents, our grandparents. And when I tell our kids, you know, something of like, oh, my mom taught me this, or your dad's grandpa gave him this toy or made this toy for him. Um, there's just this, this awe that comes over them and this awareness of being connected to the past. And our traditions do that for us. They allow us to carry forward religious and cultural and family traditions into the present day and give us that connection with, with those who have gone before us. And what they do too is they help us be holy, right? Um, I think a lot of times we think of holy as some kind of like a value statement, right? We'll say the phrase like, well, I don't want to be holier than now, you know, like holier means better somehow, you know? Really, all that holy and sacred mean is set apart. That these are things and times and efforts that are set apart specifically for God, right? Um, so when we say that the Catholic Church is holy, that's true because the Catholic Church is something completely different from the world around it. That means that, that our families, our homes, as Catholic households, they have to be set apart too. They have to be something completely different from the world around them. So um, I mentioned Christmas earlier, one of our traditions that helps us set ourselves apart from the world around us, right? I mean, like the world starts celebrating Christmas right after the 4th of July, give or take, <laughs> right? Uh, we, we need to be different, right? I mean, Advent has a place in our faith and it has a place in our relationship with God. So when we get our Christmas tree a couple days after Thanksgiving every year, we put it up. We decorate it not with Christmas tree ornaments first, but with pink and purple ribbons on the Christmas tree. And it stays like that for a week or two. And then gradually, slowly, toward the end of Advent, we start taking ribbons off and putting on actual ornaments, right? So by the time we get to Christmas, it's an actual Christmas tree. But we've lived through the transition that Advent is meant to be in the first place. Well, and another one of those, you know, abstract ideas that we make concrete with our traditions um, that I'm thinking of is the wise men gifts. Hmm. So, you know, now with seven kids, it's become a necessity. In the beginning, it was just a really good idea I read on like some awesome Catholic mom blog. Um, but giving your children three gifts, um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, so the gifts represent gold, something you treasure, frankincense, something that brings you closer to God and myrrh, something that gives comfort. And it's super fun for us to think about how to be creative with this for our kids. Um, but again, bringing you know, something that is, is rich in meaning in the faith and making it real for our kids, accessible for them. And it really is rich in meaning, right? I mean, like, as Catholics, we know this, that, that in the liturgy especially, the traditions and the, the events of the church um, throughout all of our faith history, 
they are they're brought to us in the sacraments, right? In the liturgy, we find these sacraments where those traditions and events are literally made present, right? Like the crucifixion, the sacrifice of Christ is made present in the Mass. So in our homes, in our little domestic churches, our traditions are a kind of sacramental too, that the reality of our identity as children of God is made present through our traditions, that that who we are is made tangibly present there, right? Um, and, you know, one of the ways that we do that as Catholics is in feasting. Friends, I am better at nothing else in my life than feasting, to a fault sometimes. I love a good party, especially a good Catholic party, right? I'm always here for a feast day. Uh, and But it's important for us to remember that, you know, Catholics, although we get a rap for being, you know, a little bit too focused on rules and fasting and uh, things like that, no one feasts better than Catholics, right? Um, but always in that spirit of gratitude, you know? Like, it's not just feasting in the sense of, like, indulgence, like, lens over so now I can just eat whatever I want. No, it's it's gratitude for all the goodness that God has done for me. Um, that God has given me so much that it's worth celebrating. So we celebrate all of that in the spirit of gratitude, you know? So that applies to, obviously, Christmas and Easter, big feast days like that. But birthdays and baptism days, uh, feast days of our, our saints that we're named after and confirmation saints, celebrating first sacraments and anniversaries, just every opportunity to celebrate God's goodness is a great chance to feast. And, and I match Pat's um, enthusiasm for feasting with my love for Lent. We balance each other really well. It's great. <laughs> um, you don't feel so bad for our kids because you remember they have Pat for a father. Um, but, uh, but really, you know, one of the things that you have helped me to see is that Lent is a season, you know, with its, with its challenges, um, with its sacrifices, that is ultimately about relationship, that's ultimately about connection to Christ, that the things that we give up in that time are all in pursuit of a stronger relationship with Him, um, making myself more available to God. It's not merely for the sake of discipline. And so when we see it that way, Lent can be a hard thing that actually brings joy. Um, and by joy, we mean you know knowing that we are loved by God regardless of our current circumstances. Um, so regardless of the fact if I'm fasting or abstaining that day from meat, um, that that it can be a hard thing that brings joy. And you know one of the other things that can be often very difficult but also brings joy are the teachings of the church, the moral teachings and the life of the church. Um, true and beautiful though they are, they can often seem confusing. Um, can feel unreasonable at times or even oppressive um, to those especially who are outside of the church. And for those of us who, who are entering into that, who are surrendering um, to what the church calls us to, we know that that hard thing is actually helping us to become more joyful and grateful people. That it's um, in living that way, um, in being more who we're called to be, um, that we experience more joy. Mm-hmm. And for, you know, for, so for the sake of, of witnessing to others, the traditions and family culture is a really powerful way that the Christian life can portray the beauty and the joy and the freedom and just the attractiveness of the church, you know, and of Christ himself. Um, G.K. Chesterton really captured jo the joy of Christ, the attractive joy of Christ at the end of his book, Orthodoxy. You know, he talks about how um, Jesus was never afraid of showing his tears, right? When he was sad, he literally cried at Lazarus's tomb. He was never afraid of showing his anger. You know, he threw some furniture around in the temple, right? But he said this, he said, there was some one thing that was too great for God to show us when he walked upon this earth. And I have sometimes fancied that it was his mirth. I love that. Just the, like throughout all of the gospels, Jesus never laughs. And what Chesterton is suggesting is that it's because it's too beautiful. Like, God's joy is, is too big to be contained. We couldn't handle it, right? Um, that's the exact joy that he invites us into through these traditions and the joy of our faith. Um, you know, for me as a youth minister, I, I think about all the young people over the years I've worked with who so often don't see the joy and fun of a life lived for Christ. And that applies to all of us, right? I mean, young and old alike, that's sometimes a struggle for a lot of folks. Because especially for like a high schooler, if their only experience of the Catholic Church is the Mass, depending on their experience, they might see it as boring and even pointless. So on one hand, we need to help everyone, including the young people around us, understand that the Mass isn't about what we get. 
It's not about our experience. It's not about entertainment. It's about what we give to God and receive from him in the Eucharist, right? That, that's the source of our joy. But on the other hand, we have to, have to, have to give our young people and everyone a vision of the true joy and fun of a life lived for Christ, right? We have to show them the joy that we found. And that comes up in small ways too. I mean, we've talked about some like really big things, but but it's even just in the daily and the weekly traditions. Um, you know, for for us each day. I mean, really, one of my favorite moments of the day is blessing our children before bed, and just getting to speak to them about the truth of who they are, and just how much I love them, and what a privilege it is to be their mother. Um, or you know, all of us stopping either at dinner time or. Um, when we're cleaning up the kitchen, when your phone goes off at six o'clock and we pray the Angelus together, um, or even just family dinners and checking in and hearing highs and lows of the day. Um, so there are little ways that, that we bring those traditions in. Um, and on a weekly basis, we, you know, thankfully Pat's work schedule now lets us have a Lord's Day brunch. And um, the kids know that's like bacon and sausage day and it's Woo-hoo! really exciting for us. Um, they know they get to eat special cereal that day um, that uh, mom finally like, waved the white flag on and let them have. Um, it's just, it's a fun day. We look for things to do together um, to really relax and recreate together. And that's become a tradition for us. Um, and, you know, St. Francis de Sales said, that a sad saint would be a sorry saint, would, would be a bad saint. Um, because the truth of who God is, is he's a God of endless joy and such abundant um, goodness and, yeah, just light and, and enjoyment. And, and, you know, I always think about the fact that, just like St. Francis de Sales says, you know, if we as Catholics are not people of joy, we're just doing it wrong, you know? I mean, so there's no doubt it's obvious that we all go through suffering in life. There are real and tangible hardships that we all face. But through it all, we have a God who died for us. You know, we have a God who loves us. We have a God who saves us from eternal despair. So there's no reason to to despair ourselves. Even in the midst of intense sadness, we can actually be joyful. Um, There's a French priest, uh, Pierre Telhard de Chardin, which is a terrible French pronunciation, but just go with it. Um, the quote is the most important part, though. He said once that joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. That when you see a person who is truly joyful, you are seeing a glimpse of God. Because that's where our joy comes from, right? Our joy in this life, no matter where it comes from, is a foretaste of heaven. True and abiding joy shows us what our eternity will be like with the God who made us for this union with him. So that's what we're here for, friends. And as we wrap up this Synod at home, that's just a great encouragement for all of us that this path is a path of joy. This journey that we're all on when we stumble, when we sin, when we fall down, when we mess up, it's still a joyful journey, right? The motivation to go on this journey at all, the prayer and the sacraments that keep us faithful to our Father, the lifelong learning that helps us to know Christ and His plan for us, the generosity and service that all of us have the opportunity to give, the traditions of our life, the culture that we build, it all is a path of joy. So friends, as we wrap up this Synod at Home, please know that you are in our prayers. It's been an absolute joy, speaking of joy, to be on this journey with you. And may God bless you today, every day. God bless you. Thank you again, Pat and Kenna, for sharing the connection between all we have learned in this series and the joy we experience in following Jesus and how an even greater joy awaits us in heaven. For this last gathering, our testimonials will be a bit different. First, Margaret Nyoike will share traditions and fun with the international perspective of being from Kenya. Following Margaret, we'll hear about traditions from all those who have shared their time and stories for the Synod at Home series. The Catholic Church itself is very, very rich, and it has very rich traditions and we don't take anything for granted. Africa, we celebrate everything with food, songs, and dancing. And it's not like celebrating like, um, it's not come and go, no. It's like preparation, if it is food, if it is music, it is really, 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 really well prepared. People take their time. So, we have taken all that. If you come to go to African weddings, you see all the celebrations. 
and all the dancing. So we have taken all that and brought it in our faith, in our churches. So when you go to church, you don't want to leave because you don't know, you might miss the last piece, which is little, maybe sometimes the best, the last song. Nobody wants to leave. So we have made people come to church to feel good and embrace and dance and sing and all that. So we are doing that here too. We are doing that in St. Alphonsus. St. Alphonsus, I'm sure it's known in the parish, in their diocese, that it has good, good, good music, African music. And we are all coming together as one family. People sing when they are doing, they are doing their dishes, they are doing, they are taking walks. People, and I, I kind of say, YouTube has come for the Catholic Church. Go to YouTube and type Catholic music in any language, in the language you know, the language you can enjoy, it is there. Dancing for the Eucharist. Dancing when, you know, getting ready to lead the gospel, you know. So it's music is a lot of fun. I really love my faith, my Catholic faith, because our faith, the Catholic doctrine, has something we call the liturgical ear. So you don't have to have, um, like, do the same thing all the time. Within the liturgical ear, liturgical calendar, you are kind of dictated to focus on different things at different seasons, which really, to me, it's fun. I have a tradition of waking up at 3 a.m. to pray. During the season of Lent, I wake up to meditate. I meditate on the daily gospel, the daily readings, even if it is 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I don't limit myself, but I set goals. Every season, I set goals, which I check. I put a check, it's like a checklist. Did I accomplish this? Did I accomplish this? And that is one of the tradition I learned from my mom. When I was a little girl, I would hear her praying at 3 a.m. I can still hear her voice in the morning at 3 a.m. I try to keep that tradition even today. I try to share as much as, as I can about that tradition with my friends, with my family, and because it opens up my day. I have three beautiful children. I love them with all my heart two boys and two girls, and I have one grandson. I have a grandson, and I love him too very, very, very much, dear to my heart. And the tradition I have with my children is I send them a prayer every day by text. Two of them live out of state, one of them live here, and but we have a group texting, so they get my text every day about God. I always encourage them to take 15 minutes of prayer every day. And even if they are not able to pray every day, I want them to do one thing for me, say thank you to God. That doesn't take even a minute. Just breathe in and out, say thank you to God. Favorite is that we've started to do like pilgrimages. We did one for Father Augustus Tolson, like the first black priest. So we went to Missouri and across the river and saw where he crossed the river and we saw where he was buried and we saw his first church. And so I think that was just the coolest thing was like making a trip out of seeing these holy people in the world. One of the ways uh, that we have fun is uh, our family story time. So every night before we go to bed, we read together as a family, and it always includes some kind of um, either like 
story of the saint or like a reflection on a mystery of the rosary. Uh, so it's something that if like daddy skips, like he just wants to go to bed, um, like I'll, I get I get scolded by the kids, right? It's just sacred time that we have as a family where we're, we're being inspired by other people and by Jesus. One thing we do, <laughs> um, we don't listen to music in the car on Sundays, which is rare for our car. There's almost always music going. So on Sundays on our way to church, uh, our family starts singing songs that we learned at VBS or at family retreats like Father Abraham, and it's pretty fun yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the way to church. Kids love it. They have to put up with that singing, but um, <laughs> we, we find it to be kind of a really fun way to um, get, get ready for Mass. So my mom, when she sent us to Saint, sent all my siblings to St. Thomas, and they have daily Mass there every single day, and so she encouraged us to go every single day. And that, that routine, that habit, it just is just in me. And I found the joy in just coming to daily Mass as well. Whenever I go to Mass, sometimes there's a song that kind of sticks in my head afterwards. Um, so when I go home, um, I'm humming it, I'm singing it, um, and then I just feel like I want to go to the piano and play the song. Um, so I try to figure it out, I look up online for the song, and I play it. Um, Especially during um, the Christmas time, the Gloria I really love that they, the one that the version that they play at Mary Mother. Um, so I come home and I learn that, and then um, sometimes I'm playing. Teresa sings along, or I go over. We go over have uh, lunch with uh, our families, and I play, and then they sing along too. Um, so I think that's a little fun, uh, fun thing that I do that kind of incorporates our faith um, to bring music down to the family. My brother and I, we created a game, a little competition that um, we found a lot of enjoyment from. We have a family dinner on Sunday night, so that evening we get together and we quiz one another on the scripture verses where, you know, what was the book of the first reading, what was it about, what was the book of the second reading, what was it about, what was the sponsorial psalm, what was the gospel, what was the homily about. And my brother created this, like, ranking of um, points, so, and he figured it out. But whoever was the winner of that game had to serve the other one dessert that night for Sunday and had the bragging rights for the week. We used to go out for coffee after Chad and I did it as a couple while they were in faith formation and then we'd do it as a family once they got a little bit older and their faith formation was on Wednesday nights. And we'd go and just talk about the homilies and just have time to talk about our faith in a really casual situation so that we could just, you know, Discuss, discuss and go a little deeper with everything that, that we'd heard. I think one other thing that um, we really enjoyed doing was um, celebrating feast days by going out and having ice cream. And so it is a feast day and it brings such joy. So yeah, celebrate with ice cream. I'm involved in a couple of Bible studies and I think it's just been so fun to do life with them. Not just, you know, we talk about the faith stuff, we talk about the deep, you know, philosophical questions of life, but we also just have fun together. I've had this group that I've been with through high school, so we went through high school, we went through college, and now through kind of marriage and family now, so just being able to do that and go skiing or go tubing or have, you know, Christmas parties together, but also have each other to pursue holiness with is just truly fun. I've been doing the cheerful giving for eight years. I'm 58 and I have no plans of retiring soon because I love what I do. Every Sunday becomes our day of rest and we really try to um, build that into our day. And so there is screen time that is just for free. You don't have to earn it. <laughs> we make froth for our coffee. Um, we, are, we don't have any scheduled chores or cleaning time. Um, it's just a day of kind of fun and rest um, on those Sundays so we can set it apart from all the other days of the week. And then uh, for feast days, um, so we have, our saints are usually our middle names for our kids. Mm -hmm. Um, but when, you know, so when it's their, their name feast day, then they get, well, we all get ice cream. We all get ice cream. <laughs> they're, they're very good about making sure that they're, they're taken care of, and so they're learning feast days very quickly. <laughs> ice cream is the result. So we say, St. Joseph, pray for us, and we eat our ice cream. <laughs> Christmas has been always Jesus' birthday. We put up the birthday banner that they all get when it's their birthday and we make a cake or cupcakes and we have a little plastic baby that goes in that they don't know where it is, but whoever gets it gets a special blessing in the year. We also do a little um, 
we have little uh, gift, little boxes, like they look like presents. And so then there's a little piece of paper that each grandchild gets to fill out to thanking Jesus for their special gift or some sort of little prayer. And then they fill those out and then they get to put those at the, in by the manger, by the baby Jesus for the birthday present, but thanking Jesus for all the blessings. It's fun to have that. It's great to have that and show the importance of Jesus' birth and what Christmas is all about. My family is from El Salvador. Um, and one of the biggest um, uh, traditions I'd say is um, we usually uh, wait until, Christ uh, until, um, until midnight um, and then we say some prayers and um, like give thanks for, um, and we do this on New Year's Eve too, but we give thanks for the blessings that we've received that year um, and how, you know, and where we are, uh, um, you know, how been, we've been blessed overall. And, um, and then uh, one of the traditions that, um, that I think it's more uh, uh, from, um, from the Mexican culture that we've incorporated into our tradition at home in the family is like um, carrying the, ba the baby Jesus um, and just, you know, um, for some time, and baby Jesus goes from hands to hands um, that night, and then we do some games, um, so, and some songs, and then we exchange gifts. During the Christmas season, we sleep downstairs by the tree, you know, those type of things, where we kind of camp out in the house. But we do a lot of camping, um, and when we do camp, we go to church wherever we're at. So that becomes a journey. It becomes a um, you know some uh, some fun because going to a new church is always different, but it's still the same structure, it's still the same mass. Um, but we've been at some pretty nice churches, Beautiful churches. Um, that, uh, that are kind of spread out through Wisconsin and Minnesota, you know, where we're, wherever we go camping. So um, it's nice to go there and, and people are always so wel welcoming, you know, um, and that's how we try to be, you know, with anybody coming to our church. It's a nice lesson for our kids too about yes. the mass being the same and where where your home is always at when you can go to mass anywhere. One of like the intentionalities that we committed to with the Family Faith Pen when we created it too was extending that invitation to have our priests over and inviting them into our home to bless our home um, and then sharing a meal together. And that has become such an awesome tradition at our yes. home. Like our kids like so look forward to having our priests over and the questions that they ask them, <laughs> I, it, it's just like, I mean, it's just like, I feel like a little kid because I'm just like, I'm like waiting for like, yes. how is father going to answer this one, you know? It, it just, it, it, may, it warms my heart, like when I can see our family around the table and just, and seeing God working through that, um, you know, that's a couple years ago, like, yeah. there, there's no way, I mean, there's just no way like our kids would have been at that comfort level. Um, to to feel comfortable, just to even like ask one question, right? You know, um, so that that's been that's been a huge blessing to see that progress. Catholic faith, as I said earlier, is very rich with tradition. So find your own tradition. When you go to bed at every night, ask myself. You ask yourself, whatever I did, was it fulfilling? Was it a, whatever is fulfilling? Speak to your God. Bring the Holy Spirit with you each and every step you go and you will definitely, you will definitely enjoy your faith. Thank you, Margaret, and additional thanks to everyone who have shared the intentional and active ways they live out the Catholic faith. We hope that as you watch them, you saw witnesses of what Pope Francis has often taught, that God desires us to be people of joy. Now, let's return to your faith plan and think of ways you can include traditions and fun into it. Given the various annual celebrations we have as Catholics, we might quickly jump to the yearly other section. However, as Kenna reminds us, the daily and weekly small traditions can also be very meaningful. Many of those who provided testimonies showed us that any action that connects to and gives meaning to your faith can become a tradition and bring you closer to knowing God. As you review your overall faith plan, it could be helpful to consider the balance of the plan. Does it set forth a realistic set of commitments? Is it, for instance, too heavy on daily items? 
Are the next steps clear and is it clear how you will go about taking those steps? And are you prepared to adjust the plan, remembering that the ultimate goal is becoming more like the person God created you to be? And so, we've come to the end of Synod at Home. Thank you for participating. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have and I pray that you have taken away some concrete ideas for the next steps on the journey of following Jesus. May our journeys lead us to celebrate together at the wedding banquet of heaven. It is always my privilege to welcome back Archbishop Hebda one final time as we close the series with his thoughts and blessing. Thank you, Yen, for so joyfully and beautifully guiding us through this Synod at Home. The witness that you, Pat, and Kenna have given us for how living out our faith intentionally can be fun is nothing short of contagious. I realize that contagious may be a somewhat delicate word choice during a pandemic, but if you've gained something from watching this series, I hope you will pass it along to others. The pandemic has given many of us a chance to pause and consider what is most important in life. I hope that Synod at Home has given you a helpful framework for processing next steps as life returns to normal. I join Yen in thanking each of you for participating in this process of becoming more intentional about our Catholic faith. It takes courage to think about making changes in our lives, even those changes that will be helpful. And it takes perseverance to bring to reality the possibilities for change that we see. I am convinced that it is worth it. For as we have learned in our gatherings, as we grow in prayer and sacraments and lifelong learning, in generosity and in service, and in traditions and fun, we can grow in our knowledge and love of Jesus Christ. And as our love of God grows, we can more strongly shine his love into the lives of those who have been placed in our lives. I pray that in the coming weeks, months, and years, the Lord will bring to completion the good work that he has begun to do in each of you through the Synod at Home. While this is the completion of the Synod at Home series, I hope that your participation in the Synod will not end. For those of you watching this video during early 2021, I eagerly invite you to participate this fall in the Synod's parish consultation process with small groups. It is my hope that all Catholics in the Archdiocese will engage in the six weekly sessions of Synod's small groups, which will be held at every parish between September and November. In Synod at Home, we have been thinking, praying, and talking about how to live our faith more intentionally as families, friends, and individuals. In the Synod small groups, tens of thousands of Catholics across our Archdiocese will engage in discussions about how we can live out our faith more intentionally as brothers and sisters in Christ, in our parishes, and in the Archdiocese. The discussions will focus on three areas forming parishes that are in the service of evangelization, forming missionary disciples who know Jesus' love and respond to his call, and forming youth and young adults in and for a church that is always young. My deep desire is that as a result of these discussions, as well as subsequent deliberations at the deanery and archdiocesan level in 2022, we as the body of Christ in this archdiocese will be more united and better able to vigorously and credibly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Another way to continue your participation in the Synod, regardless of when you are watching this video, is to watch the other three series developed in this Church Prepares Year of the Synod. The Synod at Home was the fourth of four series created with dual goals. First, to help us as individuals and as a local church prepare in various dimensions for next year's Synod consultations when we will engage more deeply as a church. Second, to help us grow in our relationship with God and others, outside of the Synod regardless of when they are viewed. All four are intended to be resources of ongoing value, available for free and on demand at the Synod website. That can be helpful to viewers if you are watching during Lent 2021, or even perhaps in 2025 or beyond when we will already be enjoying the fruits of the Synod more generally. The other three series are Praying with Scripture, taught by Bishop Cousins and me, Healing and Hope, a virtual retreat, featuring talks by nine local experts on topics relevant to healing and hope, and Faith and Culture, in which four topics of great interest during the Synod prayer and listening events 
were discussed by local and national speakers. Just as in City at Home, these other three series feature testimonials from fellow Catholics on how the teachings presented in this series are productively lived out in the lives of real Catholics, our neighbors. If you have not already watched the other series, I would commend them to you for your viewing. And I would also encourage you to share these resources with family and friends who, in your estimation, might benefit from them. Whenever you view them, I trust you will enjoy the content and any discussions you have as much as I have enjoyed encountering the people of the Archdiocese in the Synod thus far, and I pray that you will find them fruitful for your lives, leading you closer to Jesus. The completion of this series and the completion of this year of the Church Prepares prompts me to express gratitude to several people. First of all, to the Synod Executive Committee and the Archdiocesan Communications Department. These remarkable people, a mix of dedicated volunteers, committed professionals and staff, effectively pivoted the direction of the Synod process when the pandemic hit. The result of their agility and talents are these wonderful series that can benefit our Archdiocese now and into the future. I am also grateful to Chris Stefanik, Pat and Kenna Malay, and to all those who gave talks, as well as those who shared from their heart, giving testimonials during the various series. I would also like to highlight a couple people who I think can serve as inspirations to us all. The first is Zach Jensen. Last summer, Zach was employed by the Archdiocese as an archivist, but we learned he also had a passion for film production. Zach stepped forward when he realized that his talents could be helpful for the prayer and scripture series. His work quality and enthusiasm exceeded our expectations. He digitally put together all four series and has become our first digital content specialist, making possible new ways of promoting the good news of Jesus Christ in our archdiocese. Thank you also to David and Megan Ray for being the inspiration of this Synod at Home series. If you did not watch their bonus video to Gathering One of Synod at Home, I would encourage you to do so. Throughout history, renewal in the church has so often come from laymen and women who were willing to say yes in the ways that Dave and Megan did when they felt prompted by the Holy Spirit. Their witness energizes me as I look ahead to the Synod consultation process when I expect to hear many similar stories and gain valuable insights from you, the good people of our Archdiocese. Finally, just as prayer was an important part of the Synod at Home process, I hope that you will join me in praying for the Synod as we prepare for the consultations in the coming year and as we implement the fruit of the Synod. This year we have entrusted the Synod and the Archdiocese more generally to St. Joseph. The picture behind me is the original of the image on the year of St. Joseph prayer card. It was painted by a local artist who donated her work. So let us conclude by praying the year of St. Joseph prayer together which carries with it an indulgence when prayed before an image of St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, who gave St. Joseph to Jesus and Mary as protector and guide, grant that our Archdiocesan Synod, under his protection and guidance, may help us to, to discern your direction for our church. May we listen as he listened, trust as he trusted, obey as he obeyed receive as he received, love as he loved, and share in his life of devotion to Jesus and Mary. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you always. Amen.